In 1989, the Ohio State Building and Construction Trades Council, in conjunction with the 16 local councils throughout the state, began the Building Trades Minority Development Partnership, Inc., for the purpose of establishing affordable housing projects in the various local councils. We currently have programs underway in Cleveland, Toledo, Columbus, and by early summer 1993, we will have a housing program underway in the Cincinnati Building Trades jurisdiction. With the establishment of the partnership, it enables us not only to get back into the housing market, but afford us the opportunity to act as a nonprofit developer. It allows us the opportunities to access low interest loans, grants, and low income housing tax credits. It also allows us to form partnerships with for-profit developers to further enhance our goals of providing career and job training opportunities. In addition, we are now creating income that can be invested here in Central Ohio, which will further enhance union pension funds. Now let our partner Bob Schilling and I take you a walk around and through the historic St. Anne's Hospital site of the Bryden House. The old St. Anne's Hospital was, was founded by the Franciscan nuns over 75 years ago. It, it started as an orphanage and it was expanded uh, to a, um, eventually to a full service hospital. Its primary and its heyday was when it was a maternity hospital and many of the people who live in Columbus were born at this hospital. The uh, building is a solid masonry building and it includes about 100, 130,000 square feet of space. This space will be converted into 152 apartments, some two bedrooms, but the, but the majority will be, um, will be one bedrooms. There will be about 18,000 square feet of commercial space on the first floor. This will be home for um, the uh, city health department and uh, about 7,000 square feet will be a, a clinic. The building is ideally suited for a residential conversion. It has uh, five interior stairwells and it has uh, four sets of elevators. And if we were to design this building from scratch, we would probably we, we probably would move the stairs or the elevators more than two or three feet one way or the other. The building is ideally suited. It's going to have large central halls. It will have tall ceilings, have large windows for lots of light, and it will provide uh, much needed affordable housing for seniors in this area. And it will be a totally secured building. It will have. Um, approximately 121 secured parking spaces where residents can actually pull into a secured, well-lit, well-landscaped parking area and into their secure homes, something which is not available in the neighborhood today. Also, we have another, un another 42 unsecured parking spaces as well as excellent on-street spaces available. As you can see from the outside structure, we begin with an excellent facility. Now let's step inside and see what we have to work with there. If you can visualize as we enter the residential side of the facility, a secured vestibule where a visitor can buzz uh, his friend's apartment and uh, will have easy access upon identif proper identification. We then walk into the building to see what commenced on January 4th 1993. We see demolition in progress. Now let's go upstairs where Bob Schilling is going to continue the walkthrough. On the second floor, this is the bay area just below the chapel. This area will be turned into two two-bedroom apartments. The second floor is also the historic floor where much of the original woodwork is still in place. This is the only area in the entire hospital that's still left as it originally was. You can see some of the, or barely see, some of the tile in the uh, black and white tile in the hallway. That'll all be preserved along with the original 
all original features will be maintained in this area so people, future residences of this building can come and look and see what the original hospital looked, looked like. The original hallway again, you can see how attractive it is and this will all be maintained so people can see what the original building looked like. And this is the only one that's still original. We're now looking, uh, looking back west and I'm going to turn it and we're going to look south. Kind of dark down there, but you can see what things originally get some idea of what some of the original features look like. And all this area is going to be maintained. All the woodwork and as much original character as as possible. <coughs> Another one of the hallways showing you the good condition of everything that's existing. We're now up on the third floor. This space here will be converted into a nice one bedroom apartment. The apartment <coughs> will, or the building will feature nice large wide hallways. I think they're seven feet or better. I know a lot of times you'll see uh, five and six foot hallways. These larger hallways are certainly make people feel more comfortable, more gracious. It'll seem like a larger space, more livable in, in our thought. We're walking east across the Bryden Road part of the building. Okay, we're looking down to the courtyard. That's the roof of the cafeteria area. That building there is one that's going to be removed. As you can see, once it's removed, it'll open the courtyard to a, give you a nice view of that historical building in the rear, which you can see a little bit to the left of the screen there and it'll give some green space for people to enjoy and secure air for people to sit in and just enjoy and visit. We're up on the uh, fifth floor. This whole fifth floor was added later. One of the, I guess the second last addition to the building. This is where all the babies were brought, brought to after their birth. This is where the maternity ward was. You can look in the windows and see all your little children, your grandchildren. This, of course, will be all reopened up into uh, apartments for senior citizens. This here was all the delivery rooms. This area right here is, in fact, where my wife came with uh, our little baby boy. The first exam room that they brought her into. These are all the labor rooms, what's left of them. Must be getting dead, Dad. These are members of Labor's Local 423. And now, six weeks later, let's see what kind of progress our contractor, the Altman Company, has made. We see a project with demolition 80% complete. We see a project with the asbestos abatement completed. And we see a project that is ready for construction to begin. We have chosen a contractor who has been a signatory contractor for over 60 years. Not only that, he has an in-depth knowledge of our building as he and his family have made the additions and improvements to this facility over the last 45 years. He is cognizant of the tight schedule allocated for this project and he has given us his guarantee that he will complete this project at a cost not to exceed $6.3 million by the end of 1993. He is fully bonded and licensed. This project is not only financially sound, but it has enjoyed broad-based support including the state of Ohio, the city of Columbus, and community-based organizations. Joining me today in evidence of this on my tour is our city attorney, Ron O'Brien, and city development director, George Arnold. 
This is a project which unites near and far. It not only meets our immediate needs, but offers a future vision of labor, management, and government cooperation. We feel this project will serve as an archetype for future community development with union partnership and pension funds leading the way for a better America. Four foot one inch. Get a chance to check this out, good. Yeah, I see there's a beer can right inside here. Let's see if I can get in and get in. On the driver's floorboard there? Yeah. Probably some more under the seat somewhere. Yep. It's good stuff. That's on the driver's side? Yeah, it was on the driver floor. Okay. Right in front of his seat. All righty. Anything else in there that you saw? That yeah, was quite a bit of blood. I don't see any other beer cans. Let okay. me put this over by the cruiser. Well, we'll save that for evidence. Uh, probably involves uh, alcohol as far as a causative factor. So as soon as the record comes, we'll wrap up here and I'll head to the uh, hospital and get a blood or uh, urine test from the driver. Okay. okay. If you want to take off, because I can just stand by for the record. Okay. Make sure he gets it out again. I'll, uh, I'll meet you at uh, Temple University then. Okay. If you have any problems with these figures, I'll just give you a call. All right. Hey, All right, it, save it. Top one, two, what's your line? Four, five. Okay, somebody take our CPR and start going. What happened, guys? Five. One car one, accident, two, two, in the tree. Three. He's the passenger on belt. Uh, got three. a blood pressure of seven. Okay, ready? Four and all, ready? One, two, three, go. Got a head okay, injury, got knee uh, injuries. What's his name? Uh, he's got one epi in the IV. Two large board ringers. And Okay, anybody have a pulse? A car, car tree accident. Can you rail down? Driver. Watch your elbow. Tina, can you get the Watch your elbow. She was the driver? She was the driver. My That's the driver. My uh, What's your name? So far, uh... What's your name? So far, your name? So far we found uh, a distal right compound fracture. Okay, Mark, ready? She's got multiple lacerations and contusions to her head. All right, let's give him some place specific. Blood, do you have any O negative here? Yes, we do. Okay. Those lines are going wide open. Yeah. What do you have hanging? Both of them. Two ringers. Two ringers. Some rigidity on the lower left quadrant. My feel might be a spleen injury. Had a head laceration. They remain unequal with the left dilated. Can we be pushing drugs? Why don't you go ahead and give them some bicarb? Two for another epi. Two amps. Okay. Amp of epi. Let's give them two milligrams of atropine, too. Okay, let's get the okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tape that. Yeah, I'll sew it in later. Sure. Let's hang a uh, normal sailing there and run it wide open. Okay. okay, let's stop CPR first. Got the convulsion of her left palm. Uh, initial pressure was 90, over 60, so an IV of hers. Uh, secondary on her mark was in the injuries just stated. Uh, other than multiple contusions, there are some bruising on the, in the chest area. 
Paul, Mr. Pulse was 100. After the ringers were started, it's been 110 palp the whole way in here. She's had 500 cc's of lactated ringers so far. Okay. But it's been stable since? Yes. Okay. What the uh, other passenger, any problems with that? Uh, the other fracture, uh, possible internal injuries. He was the passenger of the car. This was the, this was the driver. Uh, the passenger got hit. Chris, I'm Dr. Cannon. You're at Timken Mercy Medical Center. What hurts you? Try to relax, Chris. Does your neck hurt you or your chest hurt you? Your chest hurts you? How about your neck? Monitors for the sinus attack, no Okay. Chris, I want you to move this arm that you're touching. Can you move this arm here? Good. How about the other side? Just wiggle your fingertips. Okay, move your legs for me. Look at your fingers. Chris, I'm going to draw some blood from your arm. Just calm down, Christine. You're taking good care of you. Joe's being taken care of. Okay. Doctor, the patrolman's waiting outside then, and he'd like to talk. Sure, let's talk with the public family. Uh, no family as of yet. Nothing has been notified. Doctor, is it okay if I... Chris, Chris, I have to ask you a couple questions here since you were the driver, okay? Okay? You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Did anybody force you off the road? No? Okay. Um, how much have you had a drink tonight, Chris? <laughs> two beers. I don't know. Two beers? You're not sure? <laughs> One or two. Okay. Before you, ha I have to go on here. I have to make sure you understand what your rights are, okay? Because I have to ask you questions about the accident since it involves alcohol, okay? So technically, I have to place you under arrest for operating under the influence. No, no. Okay. Listen up here. Before I ask you any further questions, you must understand your rights. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in court. You have the right to talk to a lawyer for advice before we ask you any further questions and to have him present with you during questioning. If you are unable to pay a lawyer, one will be appointed for you prior to any further questioning if you so desire. And if you wish to answer questions now, without a lawyer present, you have the right to stop answering questions at any time. You also have the right to stop answering at any time until you talk to a lawyer. Do you understand what I just told you, Chris? Yes. Yeah. Okay, do you have any questions before we oh, go in here? Joe, I want to see Joe, please. Well, Joe's, uh... Let me see him, please. Please, please. let me see him, please. Oh, Joe's dead. This is Mrs. Gladys Adams. Seven years ago, her 17-year-old daughter, Sherry, was killed in a motor vehicle accident involving a drunk driver. Mrs. Adams, would you care to share your story with us? Yes, I will. <clears throat> I'd like to tell you about Sherry. She was 17 years of age, a senior at Canton South High School, and really in the prime of her life. She was so full of life and vitality and it was always great to look forward to all the things she had to say about school. She was often a uh, guest at, in her 20s because she was very mature for her age. She was nine weeks into her senior year, a very popular girl, beautiful, talented, intelligent. She had just been elected the repository teen board president that fall. Uh, she was a straight-A student who had been one of the valedictorians of her class. Uh, she was in speech and drama, played the piano, uh, was uh, talented in art, with drawings and paintings, had received art scholarships, had planned on going to college. So life was at its peak for her and for all of us. They left to go on their date to the movie, and the evening passed by. And usually we wait up for anyone who is out. But for some reason, I dozed off 
and she was always in it by 1230. And when I woke up suddenly at one o'clock, I realized that the lights were still on in the house and I thought, gosh, either she's still up or she's not home. And so I rushed out through the house and realized she wasn't at home. And so then, as any mother, you begin to worry, you panic, you pace the floor, and you just wonder where they're at or what has happened. So a million things go through your mind at that point. I didn't wake anyone else. And finally, about 1.40, the telephone rang. And the lady on the other end said, Mrs. Adams, this is Altman Hospital. Sherry has been in a very bad accident and could you come? And I said, yes. And she said, is your husband there? And I said, yes, could he come too? And I said, yes, we can. And all she said was, she is critical. Well, I woke my husband up and we hurriedly got dressed and went to the emergency room at Altman Hospital where we were met by a nurse. And she took us to this small room and we sat down and she told us that Sherry was gone. And she said, do you know who she was with? And I said, yes. And I gave them Jim's name. And he was from Louisville. And they said, well, he is alive, but barely. And so I really can't explain it. You are in a state of shock. And then you have to proceed from there. And of course, uh, we went in to identify her. And you begin to make phone calls in the usual procedures that you have to go through. <clears throat> uh, our lives have never been the same since. Be because someone so, so vital, so full of life, was taken from us, and all because of a drunk driver. It seems so unfair. And because she was such a leader, had so much to offer to the world, the community, and um, uh, our holidays are never the same because there is always the empty spot. Her brother and sister, many times uh, I would find them crying because they missed her. They had so many things they wanted to tell her, ask her, and she was not there. <clears throat> uh, everyone grieves differently. The last seven years have been difficult. And you go through the grief process, stage by stage. And my husband feels guilty to this day because he's the one that gave her permission to go. And I know one evening, my daughter Annette came home from school and she said she had a date with a fellow from Louisville. It was a Friday evening, there was a slight drizzle, and it all was so parallel to the same night that Sherry left and my husband said, I will not give her permission because the fear was there that this would happen all over again. And consequently, we've become very protective of our other children, which is unfair. You can't keep them in a plastic bubble. But these are the things that happen when you have lost a child. Um, my husband, to this day, every day that uh, he goes to the cemetery, and he will for as long as he lives. And a part of you dies with them. And I, I just hope this never has to happen to anyone else, that they have to go through and suffer the tragedy that we did because of a drunk driver. Her date, Jim Davis, to this day is a quadriplegic, imprisoned in his own body. He cannot even swallow his own saliva. And his parents and us have become very good friends. And Janie and I speak to groups in hopes that we can save someone else's life, or the life of a loved one, or you yourself. So please, I tell you my story so that if you drink or use drugs, please don't drive. <laughs> Second line on your victim. Yep. He's relaxed. Relax, Joe. 
a nasty, nasty wound on the forehead. Okay, anybody have a poke? How much blood did he lose at the scene? Okay, let's stop CPR first. He was semi-conscious when we got there. It took Ten minutes to get to her. Line's gone, the blood's gone. How you doing? Your parents are on the way, okay? We'll be here. Your mom will be here. 